All right. Welcome everybody to our monthly talk about the Medicine Buddha Pilgrimage Stupa project um, and the different subjects that we've covered over the year. So if you're interested in listening to any of the other talks, they are all on YouTube and on the Diamond Mountain website if you click on Stupa Project and Stupa Project Updates. Today, we are very excited to talk to you about stupa meanings and symbols. And Venerable Sunam and I are going to explain what we know from our lineage about the meaning and symbols of a stupa. Now, there are many different interpretations from many different lineages and different countries. And so we will present what we know but if there's something that you know differently, feel free to pop it in the chat or just um, hold that thought and try and figure out which lineage that we might be coming from. Mm. On the screen, you will see a picture that I think is a great depiction of the process that we've gone through to try and learn <laughs> more about stupas, to design a stupa, um, and to come now to the point where we have the architects have signed off the plan for our stupa here at Diamond Mountain, which is very exciting. And also we have just started shipping the first piece of marble. So exciting times and a good time to talk about meaning <laughs> and symbols. So soon I'm gonna hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, honey. When you say the first piece of marble in my eye, there is some kind of one small piece of marble. Maybe you should add it's four containers full of marble for the first stupa. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, it's a huge amount of it, many blocks. Yeah. And we are happy that today the topic is stupa meaning and symbols. As you can see in this picture we are showing you, there are so many. And I can share the journey Han Lee and I made in, pre in learning about the stupas and especially preparing this talk. The last talk was quite easy. It was about architecture, which is hard facts. But the stupa is the symbol of the Dharmakaya, the emptiness of a Bodhi, Buddha. And I had the feeling when I try to learn about all these different meanings and symbols. It is the same as with emptiness. There is a point where you think you understand it. And then in the next second, it's totally different. And I see on Han Lee's face, her smile. It was really, to be honest, it was really quite a journey to prepare this talk. So please forgive if we make any errors and that we can cover a small portion of all the meanings which are connected with the stupa because it's such an incredible big field. So we tried to focus on the main ones in our lineage. Um, first, I would like to start with a quote from Jim Westbrook, which is very, very beautiful. He built a stupa in California and he was one of our main contacts in helping us to get the project kicked off. And this quote is very beautiful. And I think it shows all of us who are contributing to this stupa in any way by helping us and donating, by translating, by organizing, by whatever, whatever it is you contribute to the stupa. What an incredible karma it is and how we will benefit beings in the next 500 years when they see the stupa. I believe early on, we, my fellow builders and I, were reminded by our teachers time and again of the great opportunity at the heart of the stupa building project. That is the incredible karma necessary to even see a stupa, much less build one. 
after several minutes of this, I seem to remember most of us were in tears. And as much as karma is required for this opportunity, the karmic results are, as our Lama said, simply inconceivable. I would like to add a few personal notes here. I was very moved when Dinara from Moscow told me that a few weeks ago she was driving around in Moscow and suddenly discovered a stupa in the garden of a house. And that's incredible because she is supporting and helping us a lot with the stupa. And obviously she already accumulated the karma to suddenly see a stupa in real life. And I found that so moving, so, so moving. Let's go on with the quote. Oh, I would appreciate if one of the translators could turn on the video, then I would know if I'm going too fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have often heard the phrase power of the object, referring to the stupa, of course. I am happy to say that this is something which can be experienced. We used to joke that we are building the stupa as the stupa is building us. And here the same. I think Anli and I know already what that means, that the stupa is building us. <laughs> Maybe you too. <laughs> this is what happens during stupa building, I am sure. And it's not a joke. We all have reactions to Dharma teachings and activities, of course. It's always been amazing to me that this Buddha form, which we construct, this common materials we use, and this constructive activity give us this direct resultant feeling, as well as confidence that this feeling is real. We listen to Dharma teachings, meditate on them, try to understand them, but how can such an object as a stupa, this form, have such an effect on us, the power of the object? I think one way to understand this is as a result of all the devotion and prayers and effort directed toward and offered to the construction of the stupa as a symbol and manifest that representation of the Buddha himself. It's an incredible undergoing we do here, and I think these words express that very, very beautiful. So let's dive deeper into all the symbols of the stupa. First of all, I would like to go a little bit over the history, how the symbols and meanings developed over time. In the beginning, it was a graveyard. The stupa in itself already existed at the Buddha's time. And it was the stick put in the earth and then the earth hill was built and this was the graveyard. And when Buddha died and died, sorry, that's the wrong expression <laughs> to be used. When he went into his paradise, his leftover body was cremated and uh, there was a big fight who gets the relics of the Buddha. And then a Brahman decided that the ashes are split in eight and that at the very important points of Buddha's life on this earth, the stupas should be erected. And one example 
is the stupa we see here. It is the Shaukandi stupa in Sarnath where he met the five ascetics. And there is another famous one in Bodh Gaya where he reached enlightenment. So these are the first ones related to the Buddha. And then very soon it become a place of worship where the people worship not directly the Buddha, they worship the ideas he put in our minds, he left on this earth, the path to enlightenment. And that's also why the stupa is said to be the expression of the Dharmakaya. Later on more from Han Li about how this goes together. So then several practices evolve. And one of the most famous ones is to walk around the stupa. Now there is always the big question, do I go around the stupa clockwise or counterclockwise? And the general answer is if you are uh, open teaching Buddhist, you go clockwise, always with the right side to the stupa, because in India, the right side was the pure side, the left side was the impure side. That's why they say you should have your right side to the stupa, so that your more pure side is next to this holy object. But if you Look at it from the standpoint of emptiness. The most important thing while you are walking around the stupa is where you keep your mind. And also it's uh, very common that you are reciting a mantra. But in general, put your mind on something which is connected with enlightenment because the stupa is the representation of enlightenment. So this is a really good thing. And one of the biggest uh, circumambulations we know is the one of Mount Kailash, which is about 23 miles because Mount Kailash is also seen as a big stupa. And it's very beautiful. And we at Diamond Mountain, we do it with our existing stupa that we circumambulated, and it's paying respect to the idea, which is the, the stupa is the symbol of. And also in um, the early years, and also we have this in other religions, the stupa is the expression of the Dharma and the Dharmakaya, because at this time, it was not allowed to picture the human body of the Buddha. And Buddha really didn't want that. So the early stupas are a mathematical expression of the Dharma, which I think is very, very beautiful. And then later on, round about 400, 500 after, in our time calculation after uh, Anu Domini, then slowly the depiction of the Buddha's body and his parts have been added on certain kinds of stupas. I think one of the most famous ones is this one, where suddenly on the part which we call harmika, and Lee will explain more about the harmika, where we suddenly can see the eyes of the Buddha. Oh, Sorry. I no. forget. Sorry, yeah. I forgot my slides. That's the picture <laughs> for the circling. 
And here are the eyes. It's on the Buddha Stupa, which is very famous expression of the stupas in Nepal that they have the eyes on the hand. Um, and then another famous uh, example that suddenly we have the depiction of bodies on the stupas is the Borobudur, where we have these incredible relics all around the stupa. And this is an example of the Chataka tales, the lives Buddha had before the lives he got an enlightenment. And we also know that there is um, the whole story, for example, of the wheel of knives. But this has been later on. So in the first place is it's an expression of the Buddha's body. And I would like to hand over to Han Li. She has dived into this topic, how this <laughs> relates. And it's one of those journeys that the more you learn, the, the more you know how little you actually know. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent. So yes, the, the stupa is a representation, as Sunam has said, of the, the Buddha's body. And it speaks of enlightenment on many different levels. The outer form represents meditating Buddha, and you'll see that picture on the left, seated and crowned. And when looked from above, the stupa is a perfect mandala, which is a distillation of the picture of the universe. So there's different ways you could also look at it um, when you plan, when you walk around it and when you visit one or when you contemplate on one. In the middle, you'll see these geometric shapes and I'll talk about them a little bit more in a moment. The other thing to consider here is that when you see the Buddha superimposed, put on top of the picture of the stupa, sometimes they are done slightly differently. So as we go through these slides, you'll notice in some cases, the crown, the head and the crown of the Buddha is right at the top near the jewel. And sometimes it's in a slightly different place. So don't be disturbed if you see that this, the representation of the Buddha over the stupa is slightly different. Again, it just depends on which lineage you come from and which country you come from. So now those five geometric shapes that correspond to five elements. And they also each have a color. So in the next slide, I'm going to speak of the colors and you're going to notice that the colors are not correct on the slide because different people have different interpretations, but we're sticking with this one. Okay. So in the next slide, you'll see at the bottom, there is a square. This is usually yellow. So at the base is a square, it is yellow. I know you're looking at red, but I promise you it's yellow. <laughs> it is representative of the earth. So that would be the element that goes with it. And of equanimity. Because the elements and the colors also symbolize different aspects of an enlightened mind and equanimity is one of them. Above that, you will notice a white circle. That is representative of the dome of the stupa. It is also representative of water and the relationship to the enlightened mind is that of being indestructible, 
it cannot be destroyed. On top of that is the triangle, which is red. It represents the spire in the physical form, which is the point of it. It is representative of fire and also of compassion. Then there is the parasol, which is the half circle. It is green. It represents the wind in elements and all accomplishing action in terms of the enlightened mind. And then the last piece is the jewel or jewel drop. It's actually colorless. It has no color, right? It actually has no shape either because it's a representative of the void or space. And that is about all pervasive awareness. So this is layer one of just how these geometric shapes relate to some of the elements, some of the colors, and some of the um, elements of an enlightened mind. And a little bit later, we're gonna put another layer on top of that, which will explain each of the pieces of the stupa, the physical pieces and sections and how they also relate. So pause here a little bit because I would like Sunam to speak a bit about the core or the inside because we've now looked at the outside mm -hmm. and begun to put that together, but there's also a lot happening on the inside of the stupa. Thank you, Han Lee. So the core of the stupa is the central axis. It is called axis mundi. In Sanskrit, yasti. In Tibetan, sokching. And it was original of this wooden stick which marked the center of the grave. And this wooden stick was never lost. It's always in each stupa, independent of the time, the expression, the country, in all forms of stupa. The central axis is the core and the stupa is built around it. When we go back, when you walk around the stupa, you are walking more or less around the stick because the stick's main representation is the enlightenment itself or unchanging emptiness. So this is really the, the, the essence of the teachings and the stupa. How come? <laughs> uh, and Today, it is still the same that you place the stick and the stupa is built around it. There is a big, big ceremony where this happens. And on the right side, you see the red one. This is some kind of a symbolized painting of how the axis looks like. It has a half dolce at the bottom and a stupa on the top. And these are the symbols that it is the connection between the world and the enlightenment or the heaven or whatever you want to call it. And this is 
also the form and the representation which a stupa ignites in us that we get our mind of our worldly thoughts and are reminded of the possibility of enlightenment and that we should take care and work towards the enlightenment. Then later on in history, it was connected to the tree of life, which has, is also a symbol for all aspects of the Dharma and the willingness to practice and to improve ourselves to reach enlightenment. Then there is another meaning later on where it was called the Merudandu or the Mount Meru, which is also an expression of the spiritual universe. And there are different options, as you can see on the left side, that's our final stupa drawing for the first stupa we built. They will be all built the same one. So the axis can either be implemented in the earth and go all the way up to the tip, or it can start on the throne or as we do at the level which is called the four immeasurables, or even at the harmika. But that's a very typical Tibetan expression that it starts at the four immeasurables, because that's where the real stupa starts. The one here, the part below that is the basis, which is officially not part of the stupa. And also very interesting here in the middle picture, you can see that also the central axis, the Sukshin, it switches shape at defined points, as Han Li has already explained with the elements and the corresponding uh, geom geometrical forms. And it's the same with the Sukshin. And that's why it's really this beautiful, and then you have lots of um, letters written on it, which represent also the chakras of the Buddha's body. And as said, the Vajra as the connection to the earth and the Stupa as the connection to the Buddha's paradise or enlightenment or Dharmakaya. There are so many different ones. So I would like to give back to Han Li, which now goes into the representation of the Dharma. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to um, make the point there that the actual Sukshin changes shape in case um, that wasn't clear. It goes okay. square. Mm -hmm. And then it has to go round before it goes to the top. So when you see the square and the circle there, that's the change in shape as the, the sokshin goes up. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. So yes, the stupa is also an expression of the Dharma and our way of learning and moving through it and that's very important to keep in mind as you look at it and as you experience it and as you walk around it. So in the next slide you're going to see on the left hand side there are the shapes and the colors that we have already mentioned and you can see in the next slide how they match to each of the sections of the stupa on the left hand side. Right? So you'll see the yellow earth element, which incorporates the 
first and second set of steps, the three and the four steps, and I'll explain those um, in the next slides. The blue element, which is water and mirror-like wisdom matches the vumpa, okay, which in itself represents a whole host of things. Then there's the red triangle, which is the fire element we already spoke about. Discriminating awareness, wisdom, right? Which matches what they call the harmika, which is the bit that connects the bumpa to the spire, which is the one with the little straps. And that also has additional representation or meaning. Then the green wind element, which is connected to the parasol, which is also about all encompassing wisdom, but the parasol itself represents compassion. And then right at the top is that shapeless, colorless white, the space element, which is connected to the moon, the sun, and the jewel represented on the stupa. So now you can see those geometric shapes and how they connect to the design and also to the deeper meanings of each of these pieces <clears throat> of the stupa. All right, so let's break it down. You're going to come back to the slide at the beginning. I'm going to break it down into different sections now and then we'll put it all together at the end. Okay, so the first one is what we call the terraces, the bottom piece, which is also the throne. And in the next picture, you'll see very, very elaborate. So it can go from very plainly designed to very elaborately designed, but it's still the same structure, still the same elements. There are three steps at the base, Right, which is part of the throne, which represents the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. That will always be there. And just like you would prepare for your meditation, this, I suppose, is like a preparation or the foundation of you taking refuge. Above that, again, it might be designed differently, but the elements are all there will be another four steps just below the bumpa or the dome. In some cases, that will represent the legs of the Buddha, but it also represents, just go back one, please. Um, so now I'm just one. gonna finish one back. Yep. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, the legs of the Buddha, but it also is representative of the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So that's the first part. And remember, this is the square, the yellow square. Excellent. Thank you. So then above these steps is the bumpa or the dome. This is often represented as the Buddha's chest. But again, remember the different representations. So don't get tangled up into that like we did. Oh, but this looks different. No, but that one looks different. And this one looks different too. <laughs> what is really important is that it links to the seven elements of enlightenment. Mindfulness discrimination, effort or exertion, joy, pliancy, samadhi, and also equanimity. And if you remember, this part, the bumpa, is representative of the round shape, which is blue. Then when we go one step up from there, we have the harmika. And the harmika in this picture is that piece that looks like um, the, the square with the eyes 
and then the lotus piece on top, it's that piece. It's the piece, the geometric piece that connects the bumper to the spire. Okay, and that's, and Sunab mentioned earlier, that's often where the eyes of the Buddha go. And you see that in this picture as well. And that is representative of the eightfold noble path right view, right intention. We spoke about that a little bit when we said you're going to walk around the stupa to keep your intention clear, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And the shape that is connected to this is the triangle, which is red. Moving up past the harmaka, we now get to the spire. And these are very often those disc-like pieces that you see that are stacked on top of each other in the shape of a spire. This is a very beautiful and elaborate picture, but the elements will still be there. And they are 13 rings that make up that spire. And it's representative of the 10 levels or bhumis of the Mahayana path and the three highest stages of the Vajrayana path. So that is the spire piece. And remember, the spire is linked to the green shape. I, I'm sorry, I'm not telling the truth. The, the next piece is linked to the green shape, which is the parasol. And the parasol is that beautiful piece right at the top that you can see that has a yellow, it looks like yellow fabric that is hanging just below it. So just like a parasol is like an umbrella. And that is connected to the green shape, which is a half moon. Mm -hmm. And it is representative of compassion. The final piece right at the top that you will notice on every stupa is what we call the heart of awakening. And here is a picture of a very large, you can see the man on the left-hand side behind the white circle. And you can see how big that, that piece is, that tip piece is, which is representative of the moon, the sun, and the jewel. So the sun and moon combination, which is the, the half, half moon with a very big round piece resting or nestled inside of it, okay, represents the union of compassion and wisdom. And the jewel that sits on top and the three together represent enlightenment, wisdom, and bodhicitta. And if you remember our shapes, this is that piece at the top that has no color, no shape, that's sitting right at the top. And so now if we bring it all together and we look at it again, we can see each of the sections as we did in the beginning. And we can see again how each of the colors match to each of the pieces of the stupa. And in this picture as well, there is more indication of what's happening on the inside. Because remember, it's not just the outside looking at it or looking from the top. It's also looking from the inside. And Sunam spoke about that core and what's happening there. There are also chambers on the inside that have very particular uh, functions and meanings. And so those are all those different elements put together into this one beautiful structure.
I'm sure that you have lots of questions as we've gone through this. And so you're welcome to pop them in the chat or if you're watching the recording to pop it either on the, um, on the YouTube channel or send us a note and ask us some questions because we are also still learning and discovering all these things about stupas. And we are, I hope that Sulam and I have given you a really good beginning of understanding and insight into the meaning, the meaning and the symbols of the stupas. Sunam? Thank you so much, Shanli. There are so many different other aspects like how the chakras are distributed. We talked a little bit about the elements. Then there is another one. If you take the stupa and look from the top to it, it's a perfect mandala. And depending on where you cut it or you have different Buddhist symbols like the swastika, for example, Then another one, how the five Buddha families correlate with the stupa. So you see, there is so many, and I think this is so beautiful that one building can represent so many different aspects, viewpoints. And as said, each lineage, each school is emphasizing different symbols. And that is also the reason, because there is such a strong symbolic behind the stupa, that there are so strict rules how to build one. Han Li is smiling because we, these rules, it's incredible. But only when you stick to these rules, you create this expression of enlightenment, of the Dharmakaya. It's the same when you pick, if you make a statue or a picture of the Buddha. Every little detail is really described. How are the angles? How is the distance? And it's the same with the stupa. And I think that what inspires in us this deep longing to reach enlightenment ourselves. And I think that's also why it's so important that when we build the stupa, each piece that we build comes along with certain ceremonies that have to be in the right time and the right place to, again, I think mindfully and with the right intention, put mm -hmm. all the pieces together. Um, and that's the next exciting bit that's gonna happen in our journey in building the stupas here at Diamond Mountain, mm -hmm. is making sure that all those ceremonies are carefully planned and executed. And this is the one and more or less most important advice we got from our monastic advisors. Do it right. Take your time. Because we are building such an incredible Thing, which we have talked now for 45 minutes. Okay, 
I can see there is a one question about the presentation. Yes, we add it to the Stupa update side. And it's very hard, but I would like to present you the actual numbers. Let's go into the worldly stuff of the Stupa. Okay, if there are no other questions, we can do that. But even if you're listening to the recording, please feel free to send us questions you might have. Yes, Taiwan is over 1 million. Woohoo, Taiwan. <laughs> I see Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, all you out there. Um, Singapore is going very constantly, very beautiful. Malaysia is running up to Singapore. Samdee is also very constantly improving every month. The biggest jump this month was the Dr. Blue or Fearless Sage Stupa. Thank you so much, Fearless Sage, for always taking care of us. Mm -hmm. There you can see the details about the different countries. These you find also on the Stupa update page if you want to check all the small numbers on this slide. And expenses have been, I would say business as usual, credit card fees. But the most important thing is here, which I really happy and proudly announce that we have ordered the marble for the first stupa. So this is really a big step. Now we are going out of our planning mind and really get real. <laughs> and uh, this will be stupa one and the, and the marble that has been chosen by the, the fundraisers for stupa one is the ash, which is one of many different types that they have at the quarry here. So yeah. um, I, I'll put in the chat, I'll put the link to the marble quarry page if you wanna have a quick look at that while Sunam is chatting a bit. Good. That's it for today. Thank you so much. I try to always remind what incredible thing we are doing here. What incredible karma we have to be part of this project. To make a stupa come into being. I rejoice in each and every one of you. I think it will connect us karmically for many lifetimes to be in this project together. And I say thank you and see you next month with the topic reforestation. Let's green up Diamond Mountain. Thank you very much to all the translators and everyone who's come to the chat. Thank you so much.